Listen. Sorry, Dr. Flo. I promise that Mind Pop will have an annoying trend thrown their way very soon. Yes, yes, a popular trend. You mean like skinny tea, crossfit, or transformation contest? No, you fool. Much darker, much more sinister. Should I summon Agent Troll? Go, find him, then report to me immediately. You'll never see this coming, Master! I'll get you, Adam. I'll get you, Sal. I'll get you, Justin. <laughs> if you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pop! Oh. oh yeah, for the first 44 minutes we do our introductory conversation. We start out by talking about the Thrive Market kits. They have these uh, after school snack kits and what else? They had a bunch of other kits on there. I forgot oh, what they were. The coffee. They, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, they had the cold man, brew the cold kit. Cold brew kit. They have all kinds of stuff at Thrive Market. Now Thrive Market is I love it. The the one of the largest non-GMO organic retailers online, but they have a lot of other products. If you go to thrivemarket.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get one month free membership and 25% off your first order. Bingo bango. Then we talk about Justin's favorite subject of all time. What is that, Sal? CrossFit. Yay! Oh yeah, we have a good <laughs> I time. I love it. We have a good time talking about CrossFit. We talk about the future of group classes. Or the lack of it. Adam makes some pretty strong statements in that part of this episode. Ooh, it's like a little bit of a roast. We talk about the importance of mobility training. Of course, don't forget to check out MAPS Prime. You just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. You can check that out. Then we talk about my morning juve routine. No, I'm not dancing. Yeah. I'm actually using red light Put therapy. Put on that red light, it's Sal. Called, what's it called? Photomodulation? Photo Bio photomodulation. Something like that. Anyway, it gets my mitochondria all healthy and working better and gets me energized. Juve is one of our sponsors. They are one of the best sellers of red light therapy. Just go to juve.com, J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash mind pump. You'll get a free MAPS Prime program with the purchase of $500 or more, and we're going to give you free shipping. Ooh-wee. Then we talk about the best time to take creatine. We are big fans of creatine. Some studies just came out talking about the best time to take creatine. You will build more muscle if you take it at this time. You want to listen to this because this definitely goes against some something we've said in the past. That's right. We great. had to change our minds. Ooh. Then we get to the questions. The first question was, can we discuss partial reps and when to use them? That's what they asked us. Uh, partial reps. Quarter squat gang. Should you always do full range of motion or is there a time and a place to do you know five inch uh, squats? Find out. Ooh. The next question is, uh, should you change your workout based on how you feel that day or should you just work out hard because you're being a big wimp? Yeah. Next question was, uh, why do some people feel their hip flexors get real tired when they're trying to do abs? Like, what the hell's going on here? Super common. Thought I was working my abs. Instead, I'm working on my hips, and we know those don't lie. When then I the, hip, you dip, we dip. Finally, this person is drinking a lot of caffeine and now has a high tolerance. What can they do? How can they bring their tolerance to caffeine back down? How do they bring back the magic? Uh, sound like I'm talking about a 10-year marriage or something like that. <laughs> Get that magic back. Let's rekindle the flame. Now, we do talk about sauna use. Uh, Adam speculates that it actually helps. He's been using the sauna, and he says it helps him with his caffeine tolerance. I think he might be onto something. We are sponsored by one of the best sauna companies in the world, Sunlighten. If you go to sunlighten.com, and if you mention Mind Pump, got to make sure you tell them, hey, listen, I heard about this on Mind Pump. Hey, Mind Pump sent me. You'll get free shipping, and trust me, that shipping can get expensive. Also, I want to remind everybody, it's November. Happy Thanksgiving. And also, Maps Anywhere, our equipment-free program. This is the workout you can do anywhere. You don't need a gym. All you need are bands and your body. Uh, it's half off. 50% off the total retail price. It's been redone, reshot. We did brand new blueprints, brand new videos. It's beautiful. It looks really, really good. Good job, everybody. Again, 50% off. Here's how you get it. Go to mapswhite.com. Use the code WHITE50, W-H-I-T-E, and the number 50 without a space at checkout, and you'll get that 50% off. Also, 
If you have questions about our other MAPS programs, we have designed quite a few programs, all of them for different goals or different people. So if you want to find the one that fits your goals and your body the best, just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Remember, Doug, you gave me that cold brew uh, yeah. Yeah, container. So there's, it's like in a mason jar. And then it has a filter thing where you you anyways, I've been fucking with that and I've been making myself cold brew. So you went on you went on where'd you get it? Thrive Market. And what is it? Can it's we pull that up? Yeah. It's like a home cold brew kit. Are we hot, Doug? Is it is it expensive? How much was it? Do you remember? Uh, it's, not it's not expensive. What's so not, it's a it's a home like cold a, brew jar. Like five hundred dollars yeah. or twenty dollars? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's not five hundred dollars shit. Yeah. So what do you so you put your coffee grounds in there, water, put it in the fridge. Yeah. Leave it. Yep. Really? It come out. Yeah. Doug, have you been yeah, using this too? Overnight. It's kind of like tea. It's like Does tea it taste good? like a slow drip to it. Yeah, it tastes good. Yeah, that's how you make no, cold I haven't brew. Used it. How how long? I, I want How come you didn't share this with us? You just I, I forgot, dude. You're Such not. an asshole sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just talk me and you, Adam. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Screw you guys. <laughs> you know uh fuck Thrive Market has a lot of shit. They do. There's like, just cool stuff. It's like a treasure hunt. You know what I mean? Like, I, I found that. Yeah, did you go on there looking for that? No. Oh, okay. I was like- No, I just saw that. You and stumbled like, across it or something? Well, because- So, Courtney will make me coffee a lot of times, like espresso, uh, especially there's, on the weekends. There's no X in espresso, but that's espresso. I'm sorry. X. Sorry. I, sorry. You know. Hanging out with me a lot. Yeah. <laughs> es espresso. I used to, yeah, I, I used to yeah. date espresso. Excuse me. <laughs> now espresso is my ex. Yeah. Anyway, continue. It's, it's, it's X. Hanging out at my library. In my house. <laughs> in my house. Uh, so yeah, so I, I, I prefer cold brew. Dude. I don't like drinking hot coffee as much. It just, uh, it, something about the, the, the warm. Cause you're a pussy. No. Cause it makes me sleepy. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a, a massive pussy. Yeah. Uh, look so, at that. Look at that. There it is. Do yeah, it man. yourself. Do it yourself. Cold brew. One, look at, they got the do it yourself home brew kit. So check that. So, so here's why I like cold brew better than, than, than warm brew. I know Justin gives you reasons of like how he feels and all that, like his feelings, but here's the real reason why. <laughs> it's stronger. You want cold no, brew? No. <laughs> will you let me fucking explain more? Oh, like, bad. yeah, dude. It's, so it's like less acidic. Yes. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Look at me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's stronger. Those are the two things that I want. So that's it. what it provides. If I could reach my hand over there, let me tell you. Yeah, what I'd be doing right bump. now. I'll, well, I, don't, I don't want the other thing. So, yes, it's less acidic. So people who have, who, who have like, some people will say when they drink too much coffee or too fast, it Damn, fucks with their stomach. Damn, it's 15 bucks, that's it? Yeah, it's nothing. That's for the half gallon. You could get the one quart for 12 or 11 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, it's yep. cheap as fuck. And it, uh, uh, it, less acidic, more caffeine, and it just tastes smoother. When I drink cold brew... Even if you warm it up in the microwave or warm now, it up after, it's just smoother. Justin, can I use like my coffee for that, or is it is it just a kit? Or is yeah. it like okay, yeah, any you coffee, just put any coffee grounds you put it in there, just like make it has its own little pouch, like like a tea. Doug, so. what is that healthy snacks for hungry kids? What is that after school snack kit? Oh yeah, click on that for me for a second. Every time we get on Thrive Market, we find something. They're new. brilliant. Yeah, you just have to sit there and like they need like a catalog. You know, like the Sears catalog used to come what? to your house. I oh, forgot about. Hold on those. a second. Yeah. yeah, they need like the this Sears is a catalog. kit. I would just look at those for Christmas gifts, bro. These are kits that they sell you for snacks for your kids. So raisins, applesauce, seaweed, the dried seaweed snacks. Oh yeah, dried rice seaweed. cakes, almond butter. Hey, your kids are gonna hate you. No. <laughs> Hold on a second. You dress it up, like. <laughs> Hold on a second. Just kids. put like a cracked out like toucan on wait, there. Wait, wait. You know? Who doesn't they'll, like? They'll eat it. Wait, wait. My kids love seaweed snacks. Yeah. See, have your kids had the seaweed snacks yet? Yeah. They <laughs> do they like? They, like, they them? like the kale chips too. So, yeah. So yeah, it's there you go, like Adam. That, that far off. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, my kids aren't like but you I, when you were a kid. Yeah. But I call it Hulk chips. You have to like make it you cool. To you have to lie. Yeah, yeah I do. Just, uh, Hulk chips. It sounds like Hulk pooped. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he, he dropped a bunch of chips. Hey, if you eat uh, Hulk poop, you holy turn shit! They have a Thrive Market Taco Night kit. Click on that. I need to see this right uh, now. Yeah. They. This is crazy. Taco Tuesday. It's less than fifteen dollars, and you get all the ingredients you need. To make tacos, except everything's organic and healthy, including the tortillas, which are made with coconut. Wow. 
Yeah. Damn, they're doing things. That sounds huh? that sounds like a fun Tuesday. Well, they're 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 killing it, and I think they have enough money need, to experiment because we need to tell Rachel to you know what I all the accounts she manages. I'm not sure how much she talks to Thrive Market. We need to get her in communication with them because I feel like every time we get on here, there's stuff I didn't know about. Yeah, there's stuff we didn't yeah. know. It makes us terrible at selling for them. We need to make sure that they have. I yeah. want like a, a catalog. Why yeah. can't we have like a catalog? Well, they just have so much shit. Yeah. You know, where do we begin? Right. Yeah. yeah, that's good stuff. You have to man. just go on the website and just, you know, look around. Hey, how about CrossFit? <laughs> hey, what's going on? <laughs> <Why are> you- <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I know. I, I'm a little bit like Glee. No, you know, what, like what are you Glee, Glee about? Glee was a thing. Glassman coming out and saying that he regrets ever teaching the kipping pull up. Yeah. Well, I'll be damned. What? Yep. Well, I'll be damned. No. You know what's what? next, huh? You know uh, what? I tell you what, man. It's. No more of these. No first more of, of these. First of all, I remember when we first started talk. When we first talked about CrossFit. That was one of our biggest um, criticisms. Was why are you doing this very specific movement that really only applies to gymnasts? Right. And when you have other people do it who aren't gymnasts, to fatigue, you're just basically asking for trouble. Yeah. Well, I'm glad they did it now. You know, I'm glad they came back on it now. Do you guys think he's just getting a lot of heat right now for for some of the shit that they? I think. I think I feel like he's abandoning ship. There's a lot of changes. So I think yeah, that he's he, like, I'm out of here. Ch- 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 changes. I think he's a smart uh-huh. guy. I really do. I think he's a smart guy. And I think I think ju- he's a really smart guy. I, I think just like I think just like us. Absolutely. Okay, just like us, if Mind Pump got to the size of an organization like CrossFit, there's probably many things within this that we would have to modify and change cause that you just did not foresee. Oh, inevitably there's holes. Right, it, always. So yeah. I think that's part of the the evolution of it. So I, I think he's... A wide- yeah, but how much of it do you change before it turns into something else? Well, right. so I think it has to turn into something else. So do I, I. I think, yeah. it's, I think there, this is the beginning Definitely. of what we've been saying since day one. Is that there needs to be a separation, there a needs, line. There needs to be the CrossFit Games and people that are Sport, training, yeah. training for the CrossFit Games, and you are an actual athlete, mm-hmm. and that's who, you, and that's who, that's how you train. And then there is CrossFit, the organization that is here to help the average Jane or Joe get in shape. That should look a lot more like just functional. Should training. look totally different. Should look totally different. So let's nothing, bring, nothing alike. Let's brainstorm right now. How would you, if you owned a CrossFit gym right now? <clears throat> How would you make it look so that you, A, maintained integrity, did the right thing for the members and clients, but B, also had the flavor, you know, of CrossFit? What, what do you guys, what, what would you guys do? I have some ideas. Okay, let's hear I would I would separate it so I'd have my co- co- competitor's class, mm-hmm. which would be people who are going to compete. So it's very specific. Yeah. Then my workouts would be classes. Which be that two would people be in that class. Keep prob- maybe yeah. right. Keep going. Then I would have a specific like skills training class. Yes. Then most of my classes would be skills training. Yeah. Olympic training class for beginners. Olympic training class for intermediate. Here's your your strength training class. You know foundations. Now you, you know, know the squats, f- deadlifts. Now you know the flaw in everything that you're saying is right. What's my flaw? The the flaw is that there's not enough people to fill those specific classes. That's and that's why they get. That's a good point. That's yeah. why they get grouped the yeah. way they get grouped right now. There's just you there in the especially 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 with the competition of them being one on every corner practically. There's just not enough people to fit those specific mm-hmm. class categories to make it profitable for these facilities. It might be. It's too- already hard to be profitable <clears throat> with how they do it now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the next thing that he should take back? Now, okay, so we have kipping pull-ups. I wish I didn't put those in there. I, I think. What's the next? I thing? think. I think at one point they're going to have to address the doing things to fatigue before you go do yeah. deadlifts and things like that. Well, like, yeah, like Olympic, Olympic lifts. lifts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, snatch. That's what I would do. I would eliminate Olympic lifts out of the fatigue-based programming. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest. That's a, that's a way bigger problem than kipping pull up, by the way. Yeah. In my opinion, we'll just compete. Yeah, yeah it's interesting that, that he chose kipping pull up first. Maybe because it's the most ridiculous. You know, probably, I think that it's the most ridiculous. At least so Olympic many lifts are like forces on on the joint, though. I mean, like it, I know why they added that though. It was just to fatigue your body doing something. You know, pulling. Well, you know why? It's because if you tell people strict pull ups, yeah, they're no, doing five. Yeah. Yeah. You well, know? that too, yeah. So you're going to say, hey, let's do it this way instead. Well, because so it's, more. it's a metric game. Like, their whole thing is about, like, how many reps you can do. Like, I mean, like, you heard even Josh Thompson saying when he was doing 
uh, like Fight Gone Bad or whatever the, the, the one was. That like, was cool to hear that. It was great. Yeah. I, he was part of that. Yeah, yeah, that's so great. I did not know that. Yeah. We've known Josh for this long, and I had no idea that mm-hmm. Fight Gone Bad was created after mm-hmm. him and all the boys. But even up. then, and him, he's just like, really? Do I have to fucking do this right now? You know, mm-hmm. like he'd already... So it's it, it literally, the thought process is just, how do I make this? Like, how do I... How do I exhaust the fuck out of somebody and, and get a bunch of reps out of it? Mm. And that's that's how I'm sure that, you know, and that technique, because there's a gymnastic background that I think Greg Glassman had. So I'm sure that that transitional move was like, uh, oh, of okay, course. let's do this. Of course. Yeah. That's exactly why. Yeah. That's exactly why they did that is, is because he had all this experience doing these things. <clears throat> Thought they were cool. Tried to t- what he tried to do is he tried to take the best from different sports, yeah, and then combine them or from different resistance training or weight type sports. And it's sort of an them. elementary move, right, in terms of gymnastics, because gymnastics are, are, I mean, dude, you, you spend a lifetime learning gymnastics. You should learn gymnastics as a kid, because as an adult, it's like damn near impossible. Right, and so, and he tried to combine them all and then make it hard by timing them and adding, you know, just making everything kind of crazy and insane. So it's a matter of time before it was. We said this early on. It was a matter of time before shit started to fall apart. Mm-hmm. And I think you're starting to. You're starting. To, you know what the big the big hole is in CrossFit. Uh, you know, I, I I wrote an article. It's not up yet, so don't go looking for it. But I wrote an article on fitness trends and how they influence the fitness industry. And of course, I wrote about CrossFit because I feel like in the 20 years I've been in fitness, they're one of the the biggest influencers. Oh, yeah, massive trend. Yeah, one of the biggest influencers of how gyms operate and people work out single influences that I can think of in the 20 years I've been in fitness. But one of the biggest problems and criticisms is the business model. And what I mean by that is it's low overhead, which is good. Uh, It's got some pull and some draw, which is good. It doesn't necessarily scale scale very well. Uh, People tend to not go after a year or two because they tend to burn out. And then the other big one is the profitability is not very good. You know, you own a box, the profitability, the profit, it's, it's hard to make a decent amount of money. So you're not going to get, so it's a tough business model is my point. And so that's what I think is going to hurt them more than anything. And we're starting to see flat now in U.S. flat growth and maybe even <coughs> decline a little bit. Are you Oh, you think because it's a tough business model, it's going to, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that tough, man. I don't, the, the, the overhead isn't very high. I mean, you just need a damn but, garage and some concrete and a, that's a, good, but yeah. it's the profit. Like, you know, when we talk to CrossFit yeah, owners, but when you they say at, the average guy makes when the you, average profit or, you know. well here it sounds, it's ridiculous because 50 grand a year in San Jose is you're, you're in welfare lines, you know, so it's fucking ridiculous here. But if you're in the middle middle America, fifty thousand dollars a year is not a. Is that average though? Considering all the clubs, and what I mean by that is, true, it's much more expensive to live in uh, in some parts of the country. But then you also have the luxury of being able to charge more and right. potentially attract yeah, more it's, people. Yeah, it's all relative. But I, I don't think it's that that dr- dramatic of a difference that. You know, I don't think the CrossFits over, you know, in the in the middle of the country are only making ten grand a year or twenty grand a year. They're probably making fifty grand a year. Re- I mean, <laughs> fifty to a hundred is is pretty normal. You know, one fifty, like I said, is on the higher end. Um, and then of, of course, and then if there's somebody listening that does more than that. There's outliers and everything. So, sure, there's some people that might somehow found a way to squeeze out. You know, the real smart people have found ways to monetize other other and other avenues of it. Right? They use either retreats that they do or they sell. You know the food going on yeah, in there. Yeah, they have yeah. the drink. Like you've just got to you got to be a smart business person and find a bunch of other ancillary items that are items that they can <laughs> ancillary items. Yeah, yeah ancillary you, you items. Add some items. <laughs> items. Ancillary items. You did some uh, great um, portraits, yeah. right? Yeah, pictures. My tongue's twisted today. Yeah. Uh, yeah so the, I think that's something that you have to t- take into consideration if you're going to start one of these. I think it just like anything else, it blew up. So a ton of people. We'll see the same thing happen in Orange Theory. There's a lot of people that are rushing in. I think any like right now, if there's an Orange Theory ten miles away, you, there's an opportunity for you to pop one up and actually compete and make decent money. That's how popular it is right now. I think CrossFit went through that already, and you know you, you saw you saw dude our buddy, you know uh, down the street from us has got a CrossFit on one one corner, and then literally within less than a block, there's, there's, a, a, there's another one. I mean, mm-hmm. it's that competitive where there's people opening up in each other's backyard, and that that's just going to – that'll kill it for everybody. At one I remember this was like with the cannabis clubs. We were the first of four to open up, and when we were the first of four, yeah, it was scary. It was risky. Nobody wanted to do it. 
And then as the law starting to loosen up, then everybody started to pile. And then the next thing I knew, I'd be, there'd be a club across the street from mm-hmm. me. And then it became very, very competitive. And then what ended up happening was everybody, w- m- bad business people, when they then th- they get in competition with somebody else that ha- runs a good business, their only answer is to reduce price. And then you get a, get into price wars. This is what made me exit from the cannabis game. Was yeah, but I, the, the cannabis clubs were very, even the shitty ones were- at Not the, at all. See, what you're, The you, shitty ones weren't profiting? No. You see, you I, I used to argue with you way back in the days about this that- no, they were not. Everybody thinks there's all, you know, where all the money is being made is in, is the black market side of it is because you have a front, you have a club on the front, on the front side, you're still doing shady deals. Those guys are making money, but the dudes that were doing it legitimately and paying all their taxes and it was not very profitable. This is what made me get out of it. It was not, we were not, I made more money at brokering cannabis and being a, a farmer than I ever did running the clubs. The clubs were not profitable. The clubs and, get targeted and quite we a were, bit. And we the- were crushing people. I mean, we had when Mark and I were doing that, we had some of the most trafficked clubs when we were when we were running, and we were at the peak time when there was only four. You know, San Jose peaked out at like three hundred and something. So the same thing is going to get. And then what ended up everyone started doing was your eighth prices were pretty standard at $55, $60 an, an, an eighth of weed. And then it would just, guys were undercutting. Before long, you were having to sell top shelf marijuana for $35. And when you- And the reason why they were able to do that is because then they would sell stuff on the back end. Yes. Yeah, they were doing all, some guys were do, selling other drugs and doing other things. Now, so. but, but with CrossFit, they're not, they're not dealing with the black market. So, you know, but so there it is makes a lot. It even, so it makes it even harder, yeah. right? And there's a lot, you're right, there is a lot of competition uh, with these CrossFit clubs. Partially because it's so inexpensive to start one in comparison to other businesses. Yeah. And I think the allure is because it's low cost that I'm going to make a lot of money. Right. You know what I mean? That I'm going to open one up and I'm going to make all this money. Yeah. <laughs> and then the profits will, will just be there. Yeah. And yeah, they're having a tough time with that because it's just, and I do see different trends and things that are sort of, uh, you know, grabbing a lot of that same attention in terms of you know the, the same appeal, like your orange theory, like- if if they have the choice of that and like the the price point, I'm sure is pretty similar. You got a nice facility. You got you know like music. Like it's just it's more well organized and less risk. You know risky types of movements. So well, I really, or, it's harder to get an Orange Theory. The cost is higher. Way higher. It's orange a, Theory is yeah. a half a million dollars to start. You start CrossFit for twenty grand. Yeah. Right. Well, so, uh, the, uh, when we talked to what was his name that we talked to, he said, uh, "Yeah, he said between fifty to one hundred grand." Well, yeah, but average. have you looked at his facilities? Not his. He said uh, on average, his no, his are more than that. No, they're said. like twenty to forty to get them. I mean, maybe more now because maybe there's more more regulation and you got to have more stuff at whatever. But I know guys that started CrossFit boxes for. Well, well, back in the day, you just had a warehouse. Yeah, and stuff you just now. yeah, concrete yeah. floors, fucking yeah. couple barbells. I mean, you could do it for easily under forty grand. So it wasn't a. But Orange Theory is a half a million to get going. But then you have but the profits, the, so and you far have the been. franchise behind it that's that's pushing it. I I really I speculated that Orange Theory would be the demise of of CrossFit. I really thought that CrossFit mm-hmm. would it would hurt CrossFit the, more than anything else out there. I thought Orange Theory was because it's going to take the everyday Jane and Joe. Yeah, and they just they have they've it's way cooler. I mean, if you like CrossFit and you like because most people that love CrossFit they love the community, the competitiveness of it, the intensity. Well, I mean, Orange Theory just took that to a whole nother level. I mean, I got my name up on the on the Mm -hmm. on the TV screen next to everybody. Proves I'm working hard. Yeah, and I'm getting points. (laughs) I'm getting points for being in zones and like, oh, are you kidding me? Like, it's just as competitive. You know, and minus all the crazy. Olympic well, that's where I always saw the flaw. I mean, CrossFit is very appealing to like, you know, the a little bit of the the outliers, like the you know, like this is our thing, like this is underground, this is the garage type, you know, movement, and uh, it just didn't really have corporate appeal. And they're trying so hard to make it mainstream corporate appeal, like change the boxes so they're like more in retail spaces and like everything's nice and presented like clean. And that's just not the culture. The flaw in all of these c- curves is another example of a, of a massive trend. You know, and people don't talk about curves a lot, but they went from fucking zero to 10,000 in like 14 years or something like that. 15 years. It was yeah. insane. But the flaw, one of the biggest flaws with curves is a similar flaw that you see with CrossFit and Orange Theory. And that's their programming, their exercise programming. Where do you go from there? You go to Orange Theory and you work out three days a week and you follow their classes. Like, where do you go from there? At some point, either your body burns out, mentally you burn out, or you get bored with the same shit. Same thing with CrossFit, same thing with, especially with the curves. 
It's the programming. It's the exercise programming. They don't offer. How do you you know how do you how, how do you move from where you're at? Well, to where that you go? that's a that's a common flaw in in any group any training. group training. Yeah, yeah. any group training because yeah. you just can't. It's it, inherent. Yeah, and everybody is so unique and in <clears throat> and, you know. To take a group of people and to uh, progressively overload or to, you know, change the program so they're constantly seeing progress, it's impossible. Yeah. Because it would be just like if I was a trainer and every client that saw me for the entire day, everybody did the same thing. Like that would never, that that would be an example of what a trainer does normally in their first six months. I mean, I did that the first Mm -hmm. six months because I didn't know better. Like I didn't know anything. And so... I taught a few of the same movements and exercises and I taught them to everybody and I just mm-hmm. I got good at teaching those movements where it's like when you become a really good trainer is you you learn to look at the individual, you understand where they're at and you start them at the right place and then you slowly progressively overload them over time with you know and that is something that you just cannot do in a group setting. You know and you can do everything you want by adding all these other little you know, I, and I think it's opened up things like for someone like Kelly Starrett to come in and just dominate and do so well because nobody before him was addressing the mobility issues and, and all the all the shit that was probably going to end up happening for people. So, you know, th- that's the other thing, too, about CrossFit is I think it's opened up the doors for a lot of people like that to come in. J- Dr. Brink, you know, I know he's he sees a lot of CrossFit athletes and helps a lot of people out because nobody – that was the same thing I saw in Orange Theory. I was trying to tell them early on, like they didn't – uh, Orange Theory – didn't have a Kelly Starrett of Orange Theory. Like yeah. there was not a, there wasn't a guy or girl that was speaking to, you know, muscle imbalances and mobility and the lack of range of motion and these repetitive movements of running on a treadmill. You know, I was the only guy in there that was modifying things and saying like, hey, after class, like you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do before you start, you need to do these things. And I try to tell them, I was like, you guys, there's a huge opportunity mm-hmm. for you guys to teach this within OTF now. I haven't been there for several years now, so maybe they're evolving that and they're trying. And I've heard that they have like a whole different leadership team that is trying to help and move in that direction. Mm-hmm. But they I, definitely tap into something that you see a lot of trends in fitness tap into and do really well with, which is that group, that community, that group motivation, which big box gyms totally lack. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the usage of memberships, you know, cla- you know, CrossFit kills big gyms. Like people sign up for a big gym, and a lot of people don't even go once. You know, they'll buy a membership, they don't even go at all. Mm-hmm. Some of them go for a few months, and I don't remember the average. Something like six to eight months, and then they keep their membership for another year and a half, and never go. When you with the group classes, something that they've tapped into that big box gyms haven't really figured out how to how to uh, you know how to take advantage of is that getting that usage and then big box gyms i don't even think they want to because they're so cheap i don't think they can have people use the gym that much they they don't have enough space and and they charge 20 bucks a month type of deal group classes and i'm going to say something i know it's going to piss a bunch of people off but fuck it i don't care like group classes need to die yes yes group classes period need to die we need to start a new trend of just individual workouts well it's a it's a it's a it's a crutch i'm sorry you know, and if someone's listening right now and they're like, I absolutely love to, I'm sure you do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's less risky. I like to go do scary things with friends instead of by myself too. Mm-hmm. If it's, there's something that I'm afraid to do because it's new, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I feel much more comfortable when I've got 10 friends that are with me doing it. But when you're talking about training your body and getting you in shape, you, sh- it's not something you do with your friends. I'm sorry. It just isn't. And so, you know the the spa- fit even the fit- if you do the exact same workout, you're going to need different weight. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's and, I, the, and the likelihood well, and then both parties are compromising. Even if you have a buddy, it's right? Like, somebody yeah, is somebody has to compromise somebody is getting, for the other person. Yeah, somebody's getting fucked in, yeah. the, in, in, a, in a partnership of working out together. Somebody's getting fucked in a triplet. Someone it, there's more than one person getting fucked in ten. Yeah. Definitely multiple people getting fucked. And as it grows, it, there's definitely a, a, a big portion. The of ideal people. situation: you have a coach, you have a personal trainer, you have somebody <clears throat> guiding you and directing you on you know the fundamentals, and then you take that ball and you keep going yourself but the value i see with group training is this group classes group businesses that that capitalize on that or 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 use that as the kind of foundation of their business it really highlights that the rest of the fitness industry is having a shit time tapping into 
a segment of the market. Like when Curves came out, they exploded with a bunch of people who'd never worked out in gyms before or didn't want to work out well, in yeah, gyms. Well, yeah, again, it's- you know, and, and, and that's what I'm saying, that there's that element there that we need to be able to tap into because otherwise, look, let me put it this way. Let's it's, say let's it's, say group exercise didn't exist. It's having a common place. If there was never group exercise, you probably would have less people who would have made the jump to work out on their own. So I do see there being a, a benefit. I'm just what I'm saying is I th- we need to be able to tap into. God, see, I'm going to challenge that, dude. It's it's because it started back in the Jane Fonda days. Like mm-hmm. this actually is what, before that, you know, yeah. gyms gyms started out group. Gyms were never yeah, this, originally and, working and, out on your and own. And why this is it will die. Mark my words, it will die. The reason why it hasn't died right now is because people are still afraid to take that step by themselves. Once it gets beyond that, once it becomes the norm, like you said, when you make the point, the prediction, which I agree with you, when you know when the the Heart Association comes out and says like, no longer are we recommending thirty minutes of vigorous cardio. Now we're recommending fifty minutes or thirty minutes of strength training. When we become when it becomes the norm for everybody to strengthen, and we change the culture. It'll change the group thing. The yeah. group thing only lives right now because it's a, it's an insecurity that we have. Mm-hmm. We don't want to go do it by ourselves because, and I get it. It's not that I don't understand it. I respect. I would it. love to see statistics on people in a group setting like that. That then take that and then they go do workouts by themselves or are motivated to continue by themselves yeah, the, and aren't you know completely dependent on that group energy to you know carry them forward yeah the very 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 first gymnasiums were you show up and everybody does the exercises together everybody does the same club training or kettlebell or dumbbell exercises Climb, yeah it always started that way but I, I mean what you're saying is 100 percent right in the sense that exercise needs to be individualized if you want any type of long-term success for yourself. My point is they are tapping into something that the individual training is missing. They're getting people to work out that other people couldn't even get to come yeah. in the gym I'm at agreeing all. with you, but don't you I, think what they're tapping into right. is the insecurities? Yes, 100%. I think they're ta- I think whatever it is they're tapping into, they're getting someone in the door. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is we need to here's here's maybe this is the answer. Maybe the answer is people need to to there needs to be a shift in the culture where we stop considering $150 a month or $500 a month on our fitness and health as being expensive. There needs to be a bit of a shift in the culture because right now if I tell somebody, hey, there's a new gym opening up down the street and they say, well, how much is it? And I say, you know, 400 bucks a month. I'll never go to that gym. It's way too expensive. We have this skewed perception of cost when it comes to our health. Now, if I tell somebody that they've got the newest computer or whatever and their new cell phone came out and it's only $1,500, people will buy it, no problem. <laughs> so there needs to be a bit of a shift because I think if people took a few hundred dollars a month out of their budget to invest in their health, which will get them triple that in, in return yeah. and invested in maybe a personal trainer because I think- Well, it, yeah, and I think that the answer is really like the, the gymnasium, the, the the gym itself is is a draw because like people do want to go to a place that has that type of energy and in, in, in culture. Like there can be culture right. when, with individual training. It's just mm-hmm. a matter of having a plan. And then, you know, whether you need a coach to kind of take you through that plan initially, but everybody's doing a plan- in the same place. Right. And I feel like we can get to that that place again. I feel like we were there at one point and then everybody again insecure like they want to, you know, make sure that that somebody else is keeping them accountable. I, always deflecting they just don't their know. attention off themselves to to, to onto somebody else. Put like you need you, to take responsibility. You got to put yourself in the shoes of a total beginner, or somebody who never really spent time in the gym, man, woman, especially you know, 35 to 45, whatever, put yourself in their shoes. It's, it's complicated. I don't know what to do. I want to go to the it's, gym. I, I don't know what to do. I agree with you, but you know? you're, you're overcomplicating it by, by putting yourself in that situation. But mm-hmm. that's your, right. To yeah. not, to not do the work and learn. Okay. And, and then a you're, lot of times you're making things worse. Yes. That's what, that's my point. My, yes, it gets people in the door. Yes. It gets people thinking that way. Is that a positive thing? Sure. I could put a positive spin on that, but the reality of things is what it ends up doing for the majority is it, it ends up being a crutch for them. They only go if they have their class. They only well, go if they can meet working. Susie. They can only meet if yeah. they, you know, all they, they get together. And is that better than doing nothing? Sure, it's better than doing nothing. But if you really want to do yourself a favor and you really want to help yourself and you really want to do a lot less work for a lot more results, you'll do the, you'll do the, the due diligence to figure yeah. out 
how you should be training your body specifically, which is a lot of what motivated us to do what we're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we put the information. I was just saying, I was sharing this with somebody off air yesterday that, you know, even though we, we the way we support this business is through our program sales, we teach you how to program in the fucking podcast. I mean, yeah. you don't have to buy our shit to fucking know. I mean, we talk about how to put exercise together. We talk about all the programs and how we've put them together and what was wrong with everything else out there. So we're providing the information for free. So there's no excuse of like, it's just, are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to get on our app, search topics that you need to learn about, about yourself, go to the YouTube channel, go to the blog. Shit, do our 30 day uh, free. Like, right. we, everything's yeah. laid out for you. I mean, it's, it, that's the thing that the, the information is there. It's just a matter of like, we need to shift the culture to think in terms of like, just take it more seriously. You know? yeah. yeah. Like I can empower myself by taking responsibility, doing the work ahead of time planning this shit out getting there you know maybe i, I find a gym that's invite i like the people you know they're friendly like th this is my type of a place or i can do it at my house whatever the fuck it is you fucking do it yourself and i don't want to downplay the social component at all because the social component sure there's some insecurities of not wanting to work out alone and stuff, but the social component is a component of health it yeah. is a it does contribute to your health in a positive way to see people you enjoy being around, to meet with people, to socialize. And you know, you guys know as well as I do, managing gyms, one of the ways I became successful was I made my gym a place people wanted to go. Mm -hmm. They want to show up and be there, whether it's because of my staff or because of other members. Working out, there are the hardcore people like, you know, like us, where I go to the gym and I kind of go into my own bubble, put my headphones on, and I'm in my space. But a lot of people like that social... There's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I just think... That there needs to be a change in the way it's communicated because right now people are, they feel like it's too confusing. Mm -hmm. And then the answer is to spend m more money than they thought that they had to spend. I thought a gym was only 20 bucks a month. They're just spinning their wheels. Yeah. I, I, I think if people took, literally took a few hundred bucks a month, which a lot of people can actually invest. Now, it sounds like a lot, but it's not. A lot of people can invest that much. People spend that much on buying, you know, the coffees every morning at Starbucks and, they're, and more on their cell phone bill. A few hundred bucks a month, you could hire a trainer to train you, I don't know, three or four times a month. Yes, that's not all your workouts, but I used to do that with clients. Where they'd come see me at the beginning of the week, I'd train them, and I'd give them exercises and workout, and then they'd do the rest on their own. So you get that component of someone teaching you. I'll give you, you, a, know what to I'll do. Give you a cheaper alternative. I mean, this is why, you know, if you were to ask me what I think is the most valuable thing that we offer, it's MAPS Prime. Maps Prime is by far the most valuable thing that we offer because it's the only thing that has the assessment in it that is that it will individualize something for you. So if you're somebody who's all you've ever done is done classes and you want to find find a small way you can start to individualize your workouts or improve yourself, just you, not anything to do with your class or anybody else, Maps Prime has that for you and then it will show you something that I can't even tell you. I have no idea because I have not met you and I've not taken you through an assessment myself for you to take an assessment and then find out like, oh shit, I didn't know I had this issue. Oh shit, I didn't know I couldn't rotate like that. It's oh wow, maybe I should address and then it points you in the direction of movements you should be doing specifically for yourself. That to me is the most valuable thing that there we just isn't a focus on teaching people how to exercise and how to practice exercise. The emphasis is all about workout, sweat, get sore, beat yourself up. There right. is no emphasis. You go to a gym, there's very little emphasis on, no, we're going to teach you how and we're going to show you how to Quality practice. Quality of movement. That <laughs> is, it's a huge, it's completely the way it's marketed and communicated is so wrong that people have that understanding and then when you try and explain it to them the right way, they don't want to hear it. They just want to go fucking sweat and go get sore, and that's all I need to do, and I just need to burn calories. What's the difference? And so then you get this problem that we're running into where the average person who, who gets on a fitness program stops. That's just and that's the majority. That's like 80% of people do not exercise consistently for a long period of time. It's months, and then they stop for months, and then it's months, and then they stop for months. 
It's just not oh, something because they part treat of- it like a job. Then they they go to work for two weeks and they and they they go open their paycheck and they get zero dollars and they say fuck this. How much longer am I going to do this <laughs> yeah, for? Yeah. That's yeah. that's why you know exactly it's, they look at it like that. It's like well no, it's more like an investment in yourself instead of thinking like it's a a job. This is you- why I think it would what a what a tragedy it's been to eliminate you know physical education. Oh my god, I was going the same direction yeah. in my head, dude. Like if if we want to go down to the root of it all, it's the uh, the devaluing of physical education, the elimination of extracurricular activities that are emphasized and just movement in general in a school, in a learning setting. Like Mm -hmm. it's so fucking valuable for kids to learn their body and learn how everything works and what benefits it. Cause I mean, if you don't, if you don't learn that at a young age, you completely devalue it. And so you keep going on thinking all you need to do is just make money. I see you make money and I'm going to be great. And the health is, is shit. Uh-huh. And the irony of it all is that that's needed more now than, than ever. Than, than ever before. I've never, it, it, I mean, I got my little nephew who's only like 11 years old right now, and I, I'm watching him play baseball and stuff. And, you know, the kid can't sit down in a squat, man. He can swing a bat good and he's connecting with the ball. And so everyone's, you know, celebrating, cheering. It's all great and stuff. But, I mean, the kid it does is already losing the mobility to sit down in a baby squat. And you're 11 years old. Like, are you fucking kidding me right now? Like that's if in if you only knew that it, how much that's probably hindering his performance. Like if he actually understood like if his body was working properly, mm-hmm. he would be even better at a sport and who knows one how that's going to hinder a sport and then two what kind of issues he's going to have later on in life if he's already dealing with stuff like that at such a young yeah. age. Like nobody's talking or addressing this right now in this generation coming up and we're going to see a fucking backlash. Mm-hmm. It's coming, dude. It's coming when we start seeing these kids today that were born with an iPad and iPhone in their hands and and no edu- no no emphasis on, you know, uh any sort of exercise at a young age and then they get into their teens look the fuck out dude mm-hmm. you're gonna have teenagers that are walking around with postures like people that are 40 yeah and what is it gonna look like when they are 40 right oh man <laughs> like they're 90 man i thought somebody was cooking uh chicken or something i was like what does that smell and it was my jacket yesterday <laughs> <laughs> yeah yesterday yeah that's, that's too much know. that's too delicious. much delicious it's because every time you come i come in here you're standing in front of the fucking red light barbecuing yourself no that's not what it was that's not what, you know i really it's like your skin no yeah. no jessica she she cooked some chicken in a in a uh, iron skillet yesterday and, and it made a bunch of you know smoke or whatever. oh i thought you because you uh, remind me of like a like a, a chicken under one of those those oh, lights yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what i'm yeah, saying yeah. they keep them warm and same like, color yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no i really like the throw ju- some herbs i'm on really you. enjoying my morning routine when i come in and I'll, I'll stand in front of the juve and just that's when I'll, I'll i'll write a post or something like that so i'll stand in front of that no thing. you you've been but really, i'm noticing i think i'm noticing some benefits from it you've been you've been doing it more than i have lately you gotta have to you're gonna have to tell me what i'm doing wrong with this one because i'll be sitting there for a few minutes in front of this light and the because we now have the what's it like the modular s- modular is that what it's called i think mm-hmm. Where it's like a, a a circuit of them. They're like Lego bricks. You can yeah. like stack them however you want. And I'll be sitting in front of it, and one of them will shut off for me. So I don't know if there's a, a break in the circuit, or I'm just I'm not starting it the right way. So I'm mm-hmm. gonna I need you to school me because every time I see you in front of it, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, I love it. I love standing in front of it. I think I'm starting. I think I'm starting to get some benefits. I notice when I turn it off, I feel a little bit energized, and I know that the studies show that it's supposed to enhance the way your mitochondria uses energy which brings me to uh, a, a topic that I just reminded me of topic creatine for the longest time now people have asked when should I take creatine and I've been saying really doesn't matter just take it anytime doesn't make a difference well a study just came out where they were actually a pretty well made study and they tested different times of when of taking creatine and if there was a difference in how much creatine was utilized and the strength gains afterwards so actually taking it all the way to performance. And what they found was taking creatine post-workout was superior. Absolutely superior. So when you take creatine post-workout, hmm. greater strength gains and greater uptake of creatine. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up because that was something that we used to say didn't, didn't matter. matter. Yeah. Well, that's because up until that point, the studies didn't really show that there was any conclusive evidence of any direction. Now, did they break down how much? Like, uh, is were, were there... Uh, they were giving them five grams uh, post-workout, but... It, let me see if I can find. 
there was a, a, a pretty significant increase in the uptake of uh, creatine which make, workout which makes sense right I mean I think it's like the wringing out the sponge analogy that I always give to people what like happens when you work out and then of course your your body's ready to absorb whatever it's more sensitive you, of that yeah point, it's ready yeah. to absorb whatever you put in it after, right after a workout so it makes logical sense that that would be the better time to to feed it, but we yeah. always said that as long as it's in your system, you're using well, it and you're getting it. Well, check this out. In the in the post workout group, gained on average about two more pounds of lean body Whoa. mass. Whoa! Wow! Whoa! Yeah. That's a big difference. That's, that's I know. Big. That's what I'm saying. It was a pretty. It's five grams that they use. They train five days a week for four weeks. So this is a four week period. Um, they they performed a periodized split routine bodybuilding workout five days per week, um, and then they did the one rep. Uh, bench press to determine uh, strength. Hmm. And they found fat-free mass much higher in the post-workout creatine group, um, and their strength was higher. So that's pretty cool, right? They think it has to do with the sensitizing effects of the of, of muscle from the exercise, that mm-hmm. they're just... It's just sucking it up. This is why I think taking something like cholesterol post workout, uh, is it, yeah, makes it makes a difference also. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's funny. I, there was more articles. There was another article I read on creatine where they're going to start, some doctors now are starting to recommend elderly patients take creatine, even ones that don't lift weights. That makes sense. Yeah, because it helps prevent the sarcopenia, the you know muscle loss that yeah. happens uh, as you age. Um, and they're also finding improved heart health uh, from taking creatine. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So wow. it's, it's, it's pretty crazy because when creatine first came out in the 90s, it was like... It was crazy because it was the first supplement that actually did something. It was the first supplement that put muscle on you mm-hmm. or made you stronger. And so it very quickly became this bodybuilding supplement. And then there was this whole controversy of, is it safe? Is it not safe? Kids shouldn't take creatine. This was all in the 90s. And studies after study after study was done on it. There's been thousands now done, and it's it's proven to be one of the safest supplements you can take. What was I don't the- think it's... What was the other benefit? I know with with vegans it had massive benefit cognitively, but what, was there also like an anti-inflammatory effect to it? it? It create this is what's tripping me out is that creatine went from being a bodybuilding supplement to now becoming a health wellness yeah. a health and wellness supplement. Right. Where just you taking some creatine is probably going to make you healthier. And make things perform better. Now, do you think that's just because in general that, and this is what I've said a lot on the show, I know we came out and talked about bodybuilders over consuming protein and eating sure. high, high grams. But in my experience, the average person, the average client that I train under consumed their, their daily intake. So do you think it's related to that and us demonizing red meat as much as we have over the last mm. decade or so? That's maybe that why. That's a good question. Now, here's the thing, though. You would have to, the the body's ability to to utilize uh, ATP from creatine is actually much higher than the amount that we will typically get from food. And you're right. If you ate a lot of red meat every single day, you're probably going to tap out. But most people wouldn't eat, even the ones that ate adequate protein wouldn't eat that much red meat on a regular basis. So supplementing creatine, it's one of those things where they're finding it's probably a good idea to supplement with it. That most people need. Yeah, that most yeah. people will get some kind of benefit. But I think the greater the benefit will go to people who don't consume a lot of animal meat and you know animal products, or was especially it vegans. Antioxidant? Both. Yeah. Yep. Antioxidant as well. Okay. It's pretty crazy because, like I said, I'm reading these articles where they're like, oh, we're going to start at, you know, recommending them in hospitals. So they'll get patients that will come in. Crazy. And they'll, yeah, they'll give them creatine to minimize like muscle loss or to improve mobility and strength or improve cognitive function or heart health. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to see a supplement like, go from hardcore bodybuilding yeah. to wellness and health. Well, it's one of the we only ones these that actually yeah, works. Yeah, in, in terms of like, yeah, actually doing something, and it's monohydrate because I know I'm going to get a million questions afterwards. What's the best type of creatine? Monohydrate, mm-hmm. regular pure powder creatine monohydrate is the one that's been studied uh, time and time again. And in when they compare red it, meat. and when they compare it to other forms of creatine, it's still superior. Some of the other forms of creatine uh, are, that they advertise to be better aren't even as good, to be quite honest. So your best bet is to save money and go with the, you know, the per the pure creatine powder. <laughs> By MAPS Anabolic. If you're looking to maximize your overall muscle and strength, MAPS Anabolic is the perfect place to start. With a full 30 day money back guarantee, there is absolutely zero.
zero risk. So what are you waiting for? Go to mindpumpmedia.com and get started today. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. Quiqua. First up is Juan S. Fit. He is fit. Can Sorry. you discuss partial reps and when to use them? For example, as someone who primarily squats below parallel, are there any benefits of doing quarter squats? Sure. We just talked about this. I was just going to say we From had- an athletic perspective, sure. You know, and not just that, but partial reps. So first and foremost, and I, I know why he's asking this question because we're such big advocates of- Full range of motion. Full range of motion for muscle hypertrophy, for, for full spectrum strength. For joint health. Joint health, stability. A majority of your training should be in the fullest range that is possible within your limits in terms of stability and mobility. Ninety so, percent of the time. Yeah. So let me let me re, let me re, let me rephrase that. Okay. You want to go as low as you can in a squat, as so long as you have control and in, in stability of that range of motion. So right. this doesn't mean you go get under a bar and then just go as low as you possibly can because if you don't have stability or or or, or you don't own that range of motion, tension. you'll hurt yourself. But that being said, there's certain. I'll give you an example of how I use uh, partial reps. So I like to, uh, I like the strength aspect of resistance training. I really am, am partial, no pun intended, to you know being really, really strong, or or at least that's something that really excites me. And so what I've, the way I use partial reps is I'll identify portions of a rep within an exercise that I get stuck at. So like in a squat, for me, the bottom part of the rep, which is mo- which is common. Is where I'm gonna be, where I'm gonna feel the weakest, or I'm gonna feel like if I get stuck, it's gonna be at the bottom. If I can get out of the bottom, I can usually squat the weight all the way up. Yeah, it's a common technique used by strength athletes. I mean, you you, you identify where your weaknesses lie, and then let's go ahead and like Train dive there. right into that. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll get into the under the bar, and I'll do a very deep squat, and then I'll I'll focus on just that range of motion where maybe I'll pause at the bottom. Or I'll come up and come back down, so I'm only training that range of motion. Another way people like to use partial reps for strength is just the way to overload the body with a much, much heavier weight. I think it was a while ago, um, Adam was telling a story when you would bench press, and she say some, some both, old lifters. Both that- benching and squatting, actually. I used, to, I used to work out with these old school bodybuilder guys way back in the days, and that was something they did to me when I was like 22, 23. Mm-hmm. I mean, I couldn't even squat two plates back then, but then they would throw three plates on my back and they would make me back off of it and then just do this little tiny quarter squat and they'd be like, I just want you to feel the weight and you'll see. And what what it did, and I, I noticed it right away, it was like, wow, doing something like that, now when I go into two plates, it, it, I felt so much more control and I felt, and, and it definitely contributes to the central nervous system, right? Getting you just adapted to feeling that much load. I've done that both bench press and I've done that on squatting before, and uh, I see lots of benefits to that. That's why, too, I don't make fun of people when you see them in the gym doing something like this because you don't know what they're trying to accomplish. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's really common for people to take videos of people doing short or partial reps and make fun of them and be like, oh, and talk shit, Mm -hmm. like the quarter squat gang Mm -hmm. videos that go around like crazy. But for or like how we teased LeBron James when he was doing that, but I think you know Paul covered that really well in uh, in the interview. Is that you don't know what they're trying to accomplish there. You don't know what the adaptation that they're seeking right there. And maybe that's all I want to do is I just want to feel that way. I know I can't full squat that. 500 pounds, but I've never put 500 pounds in my back. Most athletic moves you don't start. Uh, in a fully, uh, you know, drop down position in a squat, like you're you're just gonna hip hinge a bit and generate. You're gonna generate the maximum amount of of power, uh, you know, from a shorter range, anyways. So, uh, to be able to kind of train your body to do that, and then also work on the acceleration of that with weights, makes a lot of sense, sports specific wise. So. Yeah, and in in strength athletes, in like power lifters, they incorporate partial reps all the time yeah. now it's not the bulk of their training by any stretch of the imagination right but they'll do things like they'll put uh blocks on their chest so that they only do a half bench and they'll measure it off of that they'll also it, now here's the thing though they'll also pull off of but they blocks. have a foundation established of strength so the full right. range is is covered but they also lengthen the range of motion right. so like a power lifter may do uh, you know, they Defic- may, they may pull, deads. yeah, they may do deficit deads and then another day they'll do partial deads where they're coming off of a rack or rack pulls. Right. So there's a benefit to all of these different modalities and partial train, partial rep training 
is just part of them. The problem with partial reps is it's super. What's the word I want? Specific. Use? Well, no, not just specific, but it's um, it's alluring. Uh, to want to do oh, partial yeah, reps because you look uh, stronger. Ego. Looking, yeah. That I think that's where these videos. Uh, like I'm on board with, when it's like a guy that's at the gym that, he, and, and I see this all the time. Whether it's with squats or even leg press, where it's like you know they're just doing like not even a quarter of of the entire range of motion, but then they get up and yeah, you know they're super stoked because it's all about how much weight they can yeah, lift. It's just a, it's there was even thing. a book that was written. Uh, years ago, it was in the 90s. I want to say it was in the mid 90s. I can't remember the name of the book, but the bodybuilder on the cover was Paul DeMeo, who's now passed away. They actually called him Quadzilla back then. It was, uh, it was this dude from the East Coast with these massive quads. And the book was all about uh, partial rep training. And the, the, the whole crux of the book was the only thing that makes muscles grow is if you overload them. Therefore, if we can add way more weight the muscles are going to grow more. And so what they would advocate for was all workouts where you're only going like three to four inches of range of motion, but you're just maximizing how much weight you can lift. Now, that book obviously didn't do well because people tried it and found that after the initial adaptation of the because of the novelty of the stimulus, they were increased the risk of injury and yep. muscles stopped growing. And not only that, but they started going backwards. So it was really funny because it was, like I said, it was like something that they tried to sell uh, as a as way an to build system, yeah. And now here's the thing: the other thing too is pro bodybuilders. They sometimes will give the impression that it's better to use partial reps because when you watch a pro bodybuilder lift, a lot of times some of their reps look like these shorter pumping motions. Yeah. I'll give you an example: mm -hmm. if you watch pro bodybuilders do uh, an overhead shoulder overhead press, shoulder press, I'll yeah, see all the time. Yeah, you rarely see a full lockout at the top. It, no. They look more like these kind of pumping reps. Uh, you know, for the delts. Now, pro bodybuilders, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at a pro bodybuilder and say to myself, or for most anybody, that's how I should work out. Now, if you look at pro bodybuilders, how they worked out to get to that point was lots of full rep train, training. At the point that they're at now, what they're trying to do is minimize end ranges of motion because that may cause pain in their joints. They're just trying to get a good pump. And they do get full ranges of motion and other things. And sometimes the range of motion is limited because they don't have the mobility because yeah. they got a shit ton of muscle right. on their body. So I wouldn't necessarily look at them as well. Now, wh where would you guys say partial rep training belongs in the average person's training routine? It, intermittently. Very infrequently. Yeah, Super, right? Yeah, in, yeah, intermittently. I think I think 90% of the time, literally, you should be training full range of motion. And then like many other things that we talk about, like, yeah, like bands or chains. Right. Or bands, like chains, drop sets or supersets. Like it's, it falls in the category of that. I think it's a it's an excellent tool. Mm -hmm. I think uh, used judiciously, I think it's uh, can be can be a powerful thing to add to your training, but just, you know, be careful because with that comes this, you know, again, the ego side of it of, oh, it feels good to throw four plates on my bench because I yeah. can't do more than three plates, full range of motion, but I could sure as hell partial rep four. Yeah. And the meathead in me, I still always love 21s, you know? Oh, so yeah. That's just one of those things that all, you know, what I'll, an old just, school I'll throw that in because it's fucking fun, you know, yeah. but it's not like... A, something I'm going to program in, you know. And really I'm glad you brought that, that up. 21s, though, is they do use partial reps, but throughout the whole set, you but actually hit you the whole, the range, whole of range at the end, which is, yeah, yeah. that really For the it. listeners who don't know what 21s are, this is an old school exercise. Um, and I can't, I don't know who popularized it, but it got popular for a second in the 90s. And basically, what it is, and I use, I, by the way, I used to apply 21s to. All kinds of exercises. I thought it was a Lee Priest thing that, got, that blew it up. I don't he, remember, though. He might have been one of the guys that blew yeah, it up. I don't remember. But 21 basically is you do seven reps uh, within three different ranges of motion. And typically, it's done with curls. So what I'm doing with the curl is I'll come all the way up, and then I'll only come halfway down and all the way up. Halfway down, all the way up. And I'll do seven reps like that. Then I'll go all the way down, and I'll come up halfway and all the way down. Up halfway, all the way down. I'll do seven reps like that. And then the last seven reps you finish it all, is all full the the range of motion. Yep. I've done that with curls. I've done that with tricep extensions. I've done it with bench presses. I've done it with squats. It's actually a very interesting technique. <laughs> you uh, want a massive pump? <laughs> super crazy, crazy pump. pump. I didn't even know. Yeah, again, like I wasn't like real mm. knowledgeable in terms of bodybuilding and the pump, but yeah. I just remember how drawn I yeah. was to that. One of my favorite ways to use partial reps is with the uh, deadlift. I really, I, you know, I haven't done this in a long time, actually, but I like doing rack pulls sometimes at the end of my workout where I'll do my normal deadlifts, 
Then I'll put the bar on the rack so that it's maybe just below my knees. And then I'll do a couple sets with an additional, you know, 50 to 100 pounds on the bar just to get a feel for the, you know, for the heavy weight, get the tension. I also like the way it trains my grip because I have to hold on to a lot more weight. But man, it, it fries my body. I can't do it very often. If I, if I do that too often, I start to overtrain really, really quickly. I see it a lot too. You you touched on the bodybuilding thing. The other way that I use it when, especially when I was you know bodybuilding, was if I was in a in a hypertrophy phase. And so the main ad- adaptation that I'm chasing is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So the pump takes a priority in comparison to overall strength or range of motion for that short uh-huh. phase of my training, which in most of our programs lands in like phase three. And so. And that's a three-week phase. That's it. So in three weeks, you might catch me doing these, especially at the end of my workout, right? So if it was like a chest day and I'm training and I did like the barbell chest press and I did incline dumbbells. And then at the very end, I finished with some <laughs> what people call finisher exercises, which is common the way they use this, is a, like a chest fly on cables. And you're doing these shorter reps and you're just kind of pumping blood in the muscle. I know I'm not doing a lot of damage. Most of the damage has been done by the barbell training, by the dumbbell training that was the the heavier load. And then now my, my chest is pretty much fatigued, so I'm not going to challenge it really heavy weight-wise, but I can pump a bunch of blood and fluid into there to maximize the pump. That seems to make sense to me when you're training in a phase like that, when that's what you're mm-hmm. chasing anyways. It's just important, again, to phase out of that. Otherwise, the, that great response that you get from doing these partial reps and the chasing the pump tends to diminish after you've been doing that for three, four, five, six weeks on. Mm-hmm. And some people who always train this way, it's just you're not you're, the the returns are are greatly dis- diminished by that time. Next question is from M Vegas PT. Should you change your workout based on how you feel that day? Absolutely, yeah, one hundred percent. The 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 one rule that supersedes all other rules or laws or whatever in fitness is listen to your body. So if you're going in the gym and today is a heavy lifting day and for whatever reason you're not feeling good, maybe you're feeling stiff or tired or you didn't get good sleep, or maybe you feel like you're getting sick, change the workout and go in there and train more appropriately. Now, this, is, this isn't just because you want to be nice to yourself. It'll actually help you with your progress. Yeah. When, you, when you're training yourself, if you go in the gym and push yourself when it's probably not a good idea to push yourself, well, you're, you're going you're gonna to slow down your progress. You're going to increase your risk of, of injury and re- increase your risk of overtraining. Now, the, the hard part isn't this. This isn't really the hard part. Here's where I find it really hard to listen to my body. When I go into the gym knowing that I'm supposed to have an easier, more recuperative workout and I'm starting to feel like I'm full of piss and vinegar, that's the hard time. That That's when yeah. I want to go in there and just say, fuck it, I'm just going to go yeah. as hard as I possibly can because that's how I'm feeling. That's when it gets difficult to, to listen to your body because am I listening to my body for reals or is it just that I really like hard workouts and I'm dismissing the fact that I need a, a kind yeah, of- Yeah, and there's this whole intuition side of it. I mean, we've covered before where it's- very this is very much why we stress like following a program to the t and like going through that entire process of um you know giving it a chance giving the program a chance to kind of unfold the way it's supposed to um you know in terms of like you're saying so in terms of like i feel like a fucking like a warrior right now and i want to just destroy my workout whereas like it you know you get there and, and, and the workout itself doesn't require you yeah. to exert yourself like that. That's a good point too because how many people, especially kind of beginners, intermediate, do do they even know how to like listen to their body? That's the thing. I don't yeah. think – I think it's a learned process. Yeah. And you really have to uh, go through that um, because – yeah, like it, to be able to like I I could make excuses for myself too and trick myself to where it's like yeah well I I'm stiff and you know I I don't think it's you know I, I shouldn't really push myself today you know on the other end of that yeah because so. the average beginner is gonna be like um yeah I'm tired today you know Sal said listen to my body like it's all in their mind <laughs> yeah, so yeah. the point that I was gonna make was that I find this to be true with the opposite groups right so the the person who struggles with laying off and listening to their body and not training hard typically is the 
you know, fitness professional or the person that loves to work out all the time, mm-hmm. they're already in a great rhythm. And so someone more like ourselves, where I love to train, it's something that I, I, I would argue we're borderline addicted to the lifting out part than the other, the, than the other side of it. So it's hard for us to sometimes listen to our body, mm-hmm. scale back and not do it. Now, the opposite is true, I find, with beginners or people who don't like working out in the first place. Typically, those people need to learn to stretch themselves a little bit and to, to push or when you don't feel motivated mentally to go in, to get in there and to do the workout. So it's it's tough, right? It's tough to decide, what am I, am I feeling unmotivated to lift because I just don't want to and I'm lazy and mentally I don't feel like doing it? Or is mm-hmm. it really physically because I've had all this stress on myself today. And so it, I think it, you got to be able to evaluate yourself and know who you are. Are you that person who trains consistently, doesn't take a lot of days off? More often than not, you're going to lean towards more of the overtraining and not learning to scale back every now and then. Or are you the other person that struggles with consistency, doesn't get into the gym enough, you're uh, yo-yoing, you're up and down a lot. Mm -hmm. If you're that person, you probably have a harder time breaking through the mental barriers and you probably need to stretch yourself. Right. And, And now one thing I used to tell clients all the time was rarely do I want you to not go to the gym. Rarely, super rare. So in other words, Let's, because what I would do with clients is, and a lot of what I did as a trainer, and I, I know you guys did the same thing, especially after you've been training for a while. A lot of what you do is trying to figure out strategies to keep help people, you know, be consistent, help people have a good relationship with exercise and all that. Mm-hmm. And so, one of the things that I would do is I would have a client sit down with me, and I'd say, okay, how many days a week do you know for sure that you ha- you can make the time to 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 come? Like, how many days a week is that? And they would say something like two or three. So, okay. Three days a week. What are those days? Let's pick those times. These are now rocks in your schedule. They're immovable. You're not going to move them. Pick a time, pick days, no matter what. I want you here at the gym. Now, that being said, you come to the gym and you're feeling really tired and you're not feeling like working out. Maybe you didn't get good sleep the night before. Don't not come to the gym. Come to the gym and just do something super easy. But it's much easier to stay consistent when you're coming in when you're supposed to and doing something easy versus stay at home. And this is a psychology thing. This is why people tend to forget or that once they lose that rhythm, you know how hard it is for them to get back on track because, oh, I don't work out last week because I really didn't feel like it. I was super tired and now it's hard to, rather than just not coming in, go in, go in the corner, stretch, foam roll, walk real easy on the treadmill, hang out in the sauna, but still show up and, and, and be there, still show up. It's still game day. You're still showing up. You're just not, you're just not playing. What I love yeah. about teaching this too, because I'm the same way is a lot of time. And I apply this to myself. A lot of times it is mental. A lot of times I just didn't want to for the day or I got shit going on. And then once I get there and I'm walking on the treadmill mm-hmm. or I'm stretching, I start to feel, like I get that. into the mental space and I'm like, okay, I feel good. I'm fine. I just, we just didn't want to get here, you know, mm-hmm. and just getting there and starting movement ends up getting you in this different place. And so I love recommending that the client says, don't take the days off, come to the gym, even if it means, because rarely ever are we that sick and that bad that we should just stay home and lay in bed and do nothing. I mean, it's right. usually sick. Right. You have to be sick. Yeah, you've got to be really sick for me to tell you that because most of the time, even just getting up and walking and getting sunlight and moving is is going to promote you recovering and feeling better. So at least getting you in the movement of mm-hmm. let's do that. And then we could talk about how you feel like from there and then to make that decision. It's true too because if you look at your schedule and, and if you're being objective and you're thinking like, um... I'm kind of too tired to go to the gym. But then you look and you see what your schedule looks like and you're like, well, I literally don't move all day every day. Yeah. So really I'm feeling fatigued not because I am I need to take time off from exercise, yeah. but I'm feeling fatigued because I haven't moved. Right. I feel very fatigued with, when we're sitting in here and all we're doing is podcasting all day or for traveling and driving all day long. Man, I don't want to. I don't feel like oh, working the, out the either. The hardest time. Yeah. We just had a day like that. What two days ago or whatever? We did a. We ran three back to back podcasts, which we don't normally do, and they were each like two hours. And it was so we over six hours of sitting in this chair and talking, 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 talking. And I know that I didn't want to train and work out, and that isn't a reflection of my body not being recovered and not feeling well. It's exactly what you're saying, Sal, which is. I've just been lethargic all day long. I'm sitting down, not moving. And so learning to be able to connect that and separate, you know, is my body telling me 
that it's I've been pushing too hard and I need to back off, or is it because I've been sitting all day mm-hmm. and sedentary and now my body's just too, completely- it's a great determiner too once you actually start lifting and moving weights uh you know if it is really like your body needs that rest and re- recovery yeah, you, you'll know that right away once you start lifting the weights because it'll still be there so a lot of times i'll go through the motions i'll, I'll you know go through the exercises and then it's usually the case is i get charged up and, and my energy yeah. is you know really there and it's it's becoming relevant to me other but there has been times where you know i am i am like my central nervous system everything is it, it needs recovery recovery and it your body just doesn't perform so. yeah i have a couple telltale signs for my body like one of them is if, when my joints start to feel a little bit sore or when the insertions of my muscles so like uh like here's an example for the insertions of my like my pecs if i start to feel sore up in my armpit area or if I start to feel kind of tender and sore at the tops of my forearms where my forearms will attach that's when I know I need to go lighter in my workout and go easier. These are these, This is inflammation, not normal muscle soreness. This is more like I've been loading too heavy for too long. And it can take a little bit of time to kind of learn that about your body. But I think what Justin said early on is, is very smart. Like if you're a beginner intermediate, we programmed our MAPS programs pretty damn well. Now, if, if you're the average person and you're getting normal sleep and you know normal whatever – if you follow the program all the way out, we've calculated all that out for you. So just kind of trust the program. Unless you're sick or injured, trust the program and go through a whole cycle, which is usually about 12 weeks. And then at the end of it, you should have a better idea of how your body responds, how it feels, when you should go a little harder, and when you should go a little easier. Next question is from Emily and Maddie. Why do I feel my hip flexors fatigue while doing ab exercises? Oh, super uh-huh. common. Doing them wrong. Super common. Yep. Yeah. If you if you look at the actions of the hip flexors versus the actions of the abs, both of them uh, flex your body. In other words, both of them bend your body, if you will, in half. But there's a big difference between the hip flexors and the abs in that the, the hip flexors bend you at your hips. So right at your right at your pelvis area or a little bit higher than your pelvis where your where the hip flexors attach like the very very top of your legs bending there is hip flexors the abs the abs attach at the bottom of your rib cage and they attach at your pelvis and when the abs contract they bend you at the spine at your spine mm-hmm. so if you look at if you're looking at someone laying on their back on the floor if you can picture this with me right now imagine someone's laying flat on the floor Imagine if they sit up, but with super tall posture, like a like a like Dracula, like a vampire coming out of the out of a, a coffin, just bending at the hips. That's hip flexors. Now imagine if they lay back down and they're picking themselves up, but this time they're rolling their body up, and you can see in their low back that they're bending there and they're rolling right. the body up like a piece of paper. It's like curved. Yes, that's your abs. Most ab exercises that are promoted are. For most people, you're just not strong enough to do them. So I'll you're give you. A good, you're doing Dracula uh, crunches, bro. Yeah. yeah. So I'll give you a great example. Like one of the most uh, common recommended ab exercises. Like if you go in all the muscle building articles, laying, laying or lay, 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 hanging leg raises. Hanging leg raises. Yeah. Oh, it's the best ab builder. Terrible. Best Terrible. ab builder. Everybody promotes that. Most people can't do a leg raise properly to work their abs. When most people do a leg raise. Their abs are stabilizing their spine. Right, which is the point because I feel in my abs though, yes, you do. It's isometrically contracting and it's holding everything together. So it is involved, mm-hmm. but it's not the ideal. So we're not getting that concentric contraction. And I say it's a bad exercise, not because it's a bad exercise, but because I know that a majority of the people that are trying to do it are already suffering from lower cross syndrome. It's just because it's the most common, yeah. Yeah. one of the it's most com- reinforcing bad patterns. Yeah, so. it's very, very common for us to be in this 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 poor posture in our hips where we've got the anterior pelvic tilt and then our, we're already hip flexor dominant. So then you do an exercise that is going to promote that and you got to have really good mind-muscle connection to not let the hip flexors kick in. You know, Sal, you did a really good, I know we've done at least one, if not two, or more YouTube videos, really good deactivator. YouTube, yeah, yeah, YouTube videos regarding uh, this exact topic. So if you're not on the Mind Pump TV YouTube channel, I mean, you could literally put in there 
uh, you know, abs or look at all the playlists under abs and you'll see ones that are hip flexor deactivators. We talk about leg raises in there and doing them correctly. There's a, there's definitely several movements that, that pertain to this exact yeah. question. One, yeah. one like telltale sign, uh, if you're doing a, an ab exercise properly versus are you using too much hip flexors is are, does it hurt your lower back? If you're doing your leg raises and your, you know, Roman chair sit-ups and all these other, you know, exercises that require a lot of strength, and you're like, oh, I can't do those. They hurt my back. If I do leg raises on the ground, here's a common one, leg raises on the floor, you know, old school lab exercise, right? Oh, I never do those because those end up making my back hurt. Well, the reason why your back is hurting is because, well, there's two reasons. One, one of the main hip flexors or one of the strongest hip flexors is known as the psoas muscle, and that muscle actually attaches at your lower back, it attaches at your spine. And when it gets overworked, it pulls on the spine and you can get some tightness where your low back is and so it feels like low back pain. And number two, if you're not strong enough to take your pelvis and rotate it by using the abs, what'll end up happening is your low back will tighten and contract, stabilize your spine, and then your hip flexors will do the whole exercise. And that's what you're feeling. You're feeling that overarching in the low back because it's tightening, trying to stabilize. This is one of the main problems with people's ab workouts. And this is one of the main reasons why a lot of people's ab workouts, it's not the only reason, but it's one of the main reasons why their ab workouts aren't developing their abs. This was me for a long time. And I didn't really put any focus on it for a long time until I don't remember how old I was. I was in my early 20s and I was going on a vacation and I wanted to get real lean so I could have a six pack. And I did get lean. I got down to like 9% body fat, but... I didn't have a six pack unless I really flexed hard and it really wasn't that visible. I remember thinking like, that's crazy. I'm lean. You know, I should have, I should have a more of a visible six pack. And I had a buddy who had these, these, these bricks that stood out and I thought, I wonder if I need to build my abs. Maybe they're just not built enough. So I started really focusing on the function of the abs when doing ab exercises. First off, I could not do nearly as many reps. You know, I went from doing 20 leg raises to doing like five because at the you know I started to learn how to really tilt my pelvis at the top. Yeah. Number two, I added resistance on top of it as I got stronger. My abs built out, and then I started developing these these bricks that you could see at like 11, 12 percent body fat. I don't have to get to nine percent anymore. But a big part of it was just knowing the difference between bending at the hips and bending at the lumbar. And it's funny because this is a problem for abs. It's one problem when we're trying to do hip hinging exercises, all of a sudden people know how to bend at the lumbar. Nobody knows how to bend at the hips anymore. Right. Yeah. You get someone trying to do a stiff-legged deadlift and all of a sudden it turns into a an ab exercise, reverse almost, like where they're, where they're hunching their back. It's like, you know, th those are both important things to understand how to do, how to separate the hip bending or hinging from the lumbar and knowing how to apply them when they're appropriate. I This used to be, you just reminded me, me talking about the lowering your legs. This actually, when I was, God, I was an early trainer, I don't know why I got away from this because I think it was a, a really good uh, like proficiency test that I used to do where I would lay a client on their back and, and start their legs up completely straight and then I would have them slowly lower it oh, down. You measure the low back? Yeah, mm -hmm. and then I would see as soon as I – because you could see it right away, right? break. Yeah. Right, so you could, if you keep someone's legs – so if you're laying on your back, you have your client's legs straight up in the air, so you're, you're making like a, an L or a 90-degree angle. You have them press their back on the floor. Yeah, and then I have them slowly lower it, and then I would kind of measure the degree or angle at which they start to arch their back, then I would know. And then I could show them progress there. So you can show – as you start to strengthen those those abs and make that better connection, oh, you know, Susie, when we first started, you could only go from 90 degrees down to 80 and you would already start to arch. Look how low we're getting. Yeah. We're getting all the way down to 15 degrees or whatever. That's interesting. Have you guys ever used a goineometer? I've never used one, but it's, that's basically what they're used for. Yeah. 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 All those types of things. Yeah. That, that would be interesting to, to go through that again. I used to use it. Uh, just for my own curiosity with squats and with, uh, you know, different angles of different exercises. And it was very revealing that that was actually a great metric to kind of bring to your client and be like, look, look how much, you know, we've gained. Explain what that tool is to the audience. What is it measuring? So this is just like it, it measures angles. So you take it in. It, it's got Physical like two therapists arms. love these things. Yeah, it's got two arms and then you're able to see sort of like in centimeters or, or you know, inches or whatever. Um, you know, basically where your, your, your joint angle, uh, you know, where, where, you know, like if you're going down into a squat, this is where you stop this is your sticking point. 
And right. so now you can actually like measure that and give them like an actual metric for that. Yeah, it's funny. I used to do the same exact test. It, I think it must have been an NASM, one of the NASM protocols, maybe the CES one. I don't know. If I don't think it was. Yeah. I don't think it is NASM. NASM is the squad assessment. That was there. That because was, I did the same. I used to do the it same. It was before exact my one. NASM certification. This is what I did. Actually, what made I me, love that. The corrective yeah, ones were like single leg, you know, versions of things. Oh, I used but, to love that because there's some, some people. Couldn't even flatten their back with their legs straight up. Yeah, no, that's a good test, dude. I, it's I, a yeah. it, what I, I would even modify it for some some people. They couldn't even flatten their back with their legs straight up in the air, yeah. and then I have them bend their knees. I'd have to have them bend their knees and shorten the lever so they could do it. Yeah. it but it was a it was a brilliant test. No, it's good because it, it's for the trainers that are listening. It's a it's a cool thing to give them feedback. Like they can feel that, right? Like if you're showing them, like Sal saying, pressing their low back flat, they start to low, lower their legs, and then at one point, their low back just comes. Yeah, they'll, they'll feel it in their low back, and that and that, and then you can show them, like, look at this is where your legs are now, and then you guys go to work for the next three weeks or a month or whatever, and you've now improve that connection to their their abdominals and now they have the uh, the ability to keep that low back press flat as they lower all the way down it's a cool little thing to teach them and more than likely if you've done a good job as a trainer of making a better connection there those same people tend to have a lot of low back pain and because you've now made a better connection to their abs i bet you more than money more than more than not that you're going to have people that will now say man my low back feels yeah. great lately and that's a, and that's such a huge point the whole low back pain cuz you go to the doctor and you say my back hurts and they do their imaging and everything and they're like oh well there's nothing we can see on the mri go strengthen your abs mm-hmm. just go make your abs stronger so then a person goes to the gym and it's like, well, the doctor said I need to strengthen my abs. So they start doing all these exercises that are supposed to be for the abs, but they do them wrong, and they end up making their back even worse. It's so Technique is so important with exercises, it's not even funny. Do ab exercises with the wrong technique, you're not doing ab exercises anymore, literally. Next question is from Kyle Grangs. What are your recommendations for a busy college student who drinks high doses of caffeine on the regular and has a high tolerance? Any natural ways to increase energy or cognitive enhancing herbs, et cetera, to help perform better? Yeah, well, you have, my friend, built up a tolerance to a very powerful but widely consumed drug uh, known as caffeine. It's funny that caffeine is not considered a drug, uh, yeah. even though it's a, it is it a, is a drug. It is, it's so, where was I? I was at, I forgot why, I was at a Starbucks, I believe. And we were getting uh, coffee, and there were these this group of girls. They're, they must have been 15, 16 years old. They were all excited because it was just them. They're hanging out. You remember when you were that age with your friends, right? Mm-hmm. And all these girls were ordering, like, tall orders of these, you know, whipped up coffee drinks. But none of them were ordering decaf. Mm-hmm. So these are 15, 16-year-old girls drinking 250, 300 milligrams of caffeine plus all the sugar and all other shit, but 200 to 250 milligrams of caffeine. And I was thinking to myself as I was watching them, I was like, you know, when I was a kid, nobody drank nobody, caffeine. Yeah. Coffee was an old person's drink. Oh, I didn't get introduced to coffee until I was like in college. You know, I didn't even start drinking until I was starting to work at a restaurant. And then it was like somebody would brew a cup and I would like show up like <laughs> with bags under my eyes because I was just not a morning person. Dude, think about that. When were you exposed to caffeine as a 12, 13? Because I see 12 year olds too. Mom and dad will buy That's them a crazy. fucking. Yeah. You don't see that at all. Most of the caffeine I would have. Because they made them into milkshakes. Bro, I, the most caffeine I would have would be like 30 milligrams or 20 milligrams or however much is in a Coke. Mm-hmm. You know that's that's the most that I would end up that's having. That's true. Sodas did did you know you get a little bit of caffeine from that? Just a little bit. So caffeine is a it is a drug. It has classic uh, de- uh, tolerance building, classic dependence, classic withdrawal when you go off. For anybody who's ever you know had regular you know caffeine intake and then gone off cold turkey. You know how fucking hard it is. You get irritable, you get shakes, you get all that kind of, st- all this withdrawal sort of symptoms from it. It's crazy, man. It, I, I, I go through that every now and then. It's, like, actually, oh, it's actually one of the harder things to, to actually look this up. It's one of the more difficult things to completely go off cold turkey. In fact, you know, I could, I could not use cannabis easily in comparison to caffeine. Caffeine's a tough one. I cut caffeine completely out and I feel... But that just shows your tolerance is high because your body is completely 
adapted to it. Yeah. And the only way to get your more energy is to resensitize your caffeine. So I hate to break this to you, but yeah. you're going to have to reduce it. You got to cut it down. You're going to have to. Which is really tough because you, you build all these associations with it, you know, and you, this ritual, like for me, especially in the morning, it's like I, I've told myself over and over again that I'm useless, you know, until I have my coffee. And, and, you know, these are things that you'd have to, like, I have to like literally address that first thing. Like, no, no, no I'm just going to, you know, work on, on having water and just like going through the process to, to reintroduce it like at a very gradual pace. It's funny because you're, you're right. There's the caffeine itself is the addictive, uh, chemical, but then what happens is because you're getting it in the form of something, let's say it's coffee. Now you're also becoming addicted to the ritualization of the intake of this caffeine. Mm -hmm. So this is why, I'll give you an example. This is why nicotine gums and patches are, for some people it helps, but for other people it doesn't help. Even though they get the nicotine, which is the addictive property or, or chemical in, in, in a cigarette, they need to have the ritualization of the mm. bringing the cigarette to their mouth. Mm -hmm. So that's why they have these vape you know, pens and all that stuff. But it's still, it's the fact that you've associated to, it's a tough thing to break, but you got to go, you know, here's my strategy that I've used on clients is I tell them this. I say, what you should do with your caffeine if you want to resensitize your body is cut your caffeine intake in half first. And the way you can do this is if you drink, let's say you drink 16 ounces or eight ounces of coffee, go four ounces of regular and four ounces of decaf, just so that everything else is the same. The only difference is you have less caffeine. Do that for a while. Then what you're going to do is you're going to cut that in half. And one strategy I do is I go every other day, decaf, every other day, half calf. Do that for about a week, then go down to every third day and then go down to zero. And that seems to make it easier because the cold turkey is fucking hard. What are your thoughts on like sauna use here? Because I, I mean, to me, this is just like anything else. I mean, we are any other drug that we we get addicted to and it just because it's become so widely accepted and popular we don't uh we don't shame it you know it's uh, Starbucks in every corner it's a normal thing let's go meet and have coffee and so because it doesn't have this uh negative stigma that comes with it we're we're okay with it yeah but imagine if, if caffeine just got invent got discovered right now we would totally regulate it and treat it like <laughs> oh, a drug. We'd, totally. like, we'd label it speed that's yeah. that's yeah. exactly like right that, yeah. so it to me it's no different than all of them any drug that i've introduced to my in my life and that i find myself using more frequent than i probably should um i always try and watch that right i always give myself these parameters and and I think everybody should do this for themselves. Like, who am I to say what's too much caffeine for you or not enough caffeine sure. for you, you know? And for me, I know that if I'm having more than two cups in a day, and I allow myself this little wiggle room, like two cups in a day for me is plenty of caffeine. I don't feel like it's taking over my life. If I decide I want to just completely go, I don't want none for a week. I don't go through these crazy withdrawals. But I have allowed myself back in the speed stack days. I mean, I have had allowed myself to push the caffeine really high and then coming off of it's been really hard. The same thing I, I've talked about with Vicodin, the same thing with nicotine, the same thing with marijuana. Like if I allow myself to push the push it really, really high, then it becomes really, really tough to try and get rid of it and, and be done with it. But if you're if you've pushed that high, then my recommendation, whether you go cold turkey or you slowly come off of it, you get off and then you set these parameters where you watch yourself and you catch yourself when you start to creep up, and then you and then you need to be able to reverse down there. Now, why I asked the the sauna thing is, that's always helped me. I don't know why, and I don't know if there if there there is any correlation with that. But when I'm trying to get something uh, out of my system or stop using something a lot, well, getting in the sauna and just letting myself sweat it all out makes me feel better. And I don't know if that has something to do with resetting me. I don't know. I don't know if it's in. In it's. I've been taking in so much of it that I'm sweating some of it out. Do you know if there's any sort of science to support? <laughs> that's a good question. Using that as a tool. Yeah, that's a good question because the 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 caffeine gets processed by the liver, and does sauna use improve the liver's ability to detox? That's that's a very very good question. I would speculate that it probably does. The other thing too is that saunas have been shown to speed up the removal of 
uh, heavy metals, uh, chemicals in the body, through the lymphatic system, just through the sweating process. Um, so that's a very good question. The other thing too is the sauna is a parasympathetic state. So when you go, mm-hmm. unless you're pushing yourself to the max, right? If you go in the sauna and you're going for time, then it can start to become sympathetic. But if you use a sauna regularly, it's helping your body. You're, you're bringing your body back into parasympathetic. And I think that may be why it's helping you feel better because caffeine is sympathetic. Right. So it may help offset the sympathetic effects of caffeine with the parasympathetic effects of the sauna. You know, here the thing with caffeine is this: is there are um, it's it's definitely my favorite drug in the world by far. If I had to look at all the yeah. substances I've ever tried or used and supplements I've ever tried or used, caffeine is my favorite. When I'm sensitive to it, when I don't have a high tolerance, like if I if I'm using appropriate levels of caffeine for my body, there's it's great. I can take 200 milligrams of caffeine for me. And boy, does it improve my creativity, productivity, my energy, my workouts, my focus. I become happier. It's an antidepressant. It's a natural antidepressant. It's a natural, you know, cognitive booster. Um, it's, it, I'll perceive, it helps people perceive pain less. There's all these amazing benefits when you don't have a high tolerance. But what happens when you have a high tolerance is you need to increase your intake of caffeine more and more to start to feel it. But then as you increase it, the side effects also start to increase. So for me, once I start to go back past 200 milligrams, now I'm starting to feel more of the anxiety, more of the cold sweats. I start to feel, it starts to affect my sleep a little bit more and I get less of the benefits and more of the negatives. Now I use that as a motivating factor. So I, you know, yes, I I definitely look at my caffeine intake and think, okay, I need to lower it a little bit because I've been having too much. But one of my main motivators is, it's losing its magic. Oh, that's absolutely mm-hmm. mine. Yeah. Because I know once I go from, you know, one cup to two cup to three cup to four cup, now if I only have two cups, I don't feel anything. Mm-hmm. I yeah. could go to sleep on two cups. And that to me right away is like, well, fuck, I don't want to drink six just to get the same feeling I was getting from one. The same way I treat marijuana. Marijuana is the same way too. Yeah. People always wonder like how I manage that. It's like, man, it's not that hard for me to... Because I know as soon as I get to that point where I find myself needing more of it to get that same relief or same feeling, that's right away my sign like, oh, just take a few days off of it. If I take a few days off of it, resets it right away. And it's, you know, it's just, it's a smart way to manage it. So I'm not spending hundreds of dollars every single month on cannabis. I can spend fucking $80 (laughs) and it lasts me all month long. Otherwise you end up, you know, just continuing to increase your tolerance. That's just it. And we have an issue. We're talking about marijuana and caffeine. They remind, I think we're going to see this uh, with marijuana because it's becoming so widely accepted now. It's be, it's people are going to start to learn. Oh, that. it's totally. And and I already see where where it leads to, and it leads to these guys and girls that are listening right now that dab, and it's like. I, I'm a super pro marijuana dude. You know that we've talked about it on the show a million times. I couldn't fucking dab if you pay me. It's just way too concentrated, way too strong. And your tolerance it, has to be you, so high. It, it has it. to be so high. And to if you're somebody who if you care about your overall health and you want to and you're trying to pay attention to these things, if your body is becoming dependent or addicted to something. If you're at that level where you're having to dab, bro, it's like it would be like snorting caffeine. Like I need, I can't yeah. feel coffee anymore. I have to snort. It's like literally yes. that equivalent, you know. So I, yeah, I, I'm I'm 100 percent with you. And with that, if you go to mindpumpfree.com, you can check out some of the free guides that we like to offer people. These are guides that will help you build your legs, build your squat, work out your midsection, help you burn body fat. They're totally free, lots of value. It's at mindpumpfree.com. The other thing, too, is uh, we all have Instagram pages, and all of us provide different value that you may not get from the show um, on our own personal social media pages. So my page is Mind Pump Sal, Justin is Mind Pump Justin, and Adam is on Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. 
With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.